Well, hello. It's uh, ni ni nice to be among geographers. Uh, since working with David in the last couple of years, I've learned a little bit because I gave geography up at 12. And uh, so that says about as much as it needs to be said about what I actually know about geography. Um, and, uh, but I have been very impressed with the fact that geographers are asking a lot of questions, which I find uh, that very much some of the questions that I'm trying to ask. And uh, they've also, some of them have written, I can see Roger over there, quite critically about some of the ideas I've had and sometimes their non-applicability as well as their applicability to geography. So there's quite a nice dialogue going on between us, which I appreciate. Um, what I'm going to, what um, uh, I've called my talk, Powerful Knowledge, Knowledge of the Powerful and the Curriculum. Um, and so I want to talk about knowledge because it's normally not a thing. And I want us to sort of just reassure you, particularly those, that in a sense it's not some special thing for philosophers to think and talk about. It's actually something that is part, uh, in a sense, of all of us. And uh, the, um, in a sense I was reminded of this uh, by the French sociologist uh, Emile Durkheim, who wrote, died in 1918. But in fact, in, he, he wrote about these things. And at one point he said he wanted to bring knowledge down from the air rarefied world of epistemology and transcendentalism and the kind of way in which it's discussed actually into uh, the, for what for he was the real world. So that's what I want to do. I also want to say um, why I found it useful in thinking about knowledge and education to use this concept of powerful knowledge which uh, uh, David has referred to. Because what I'm struck by in recent years is that knowledge is has been the most misunderstood, the most neglected idea in educational studies, more probably in faculties of education than among school teachers. You only have to look at something like the curriculum studies literature if you ever do. I don't recommend it, actually. Uh, but if you do, you find knowledge hardly appears. Lots about skills, lots about learning, but a striking absence about knowledge. I have written about that somewhere. One of the good things about them is that, in fact, in the journal of curriculum studies has got a new editor, and therefore they've been willing to accept a paper of mine which tries to tell them what their crisis is. Whether they like that or not, I don't know. Um, it, uh, what seem, I think seems to have happened implicitly or explicitly, knowledge has been seen as something that's in some kind of way elitist, some kind of way imposed, some kind of way associated with nasty things like rote learning and memorization. You only have to look, those of you who might have done, at the letter in The Independent a few weeks ago from people who describe themselves as 100 top teacher educators. Maybe there are some who are here uh, on the list who are here today. Uh, but in fact, that really exemplifies it because in fact the thing they were most worried about the new curriculum is that it gave too much emphasis on knowledge. Um, now just, uh, David mentioned my 2008 book, Bringing Knowledge Back In. And uh, its subtitle was uh, From Social Constructivism to Social Realism. However, I think I would want it understood in a slightly different way uh, and uh, in, a, in a way perhaps a little bit less polemically because it's not actually about trying to replace a constructivist view with a realist view. It's about saying, in a sense, that we need to rethink what we mean when we talk about knowledge being social constructed. Uh, and also to make the point that in a sense there is no knowledge that is not socially constructed and therefore we have to start from there whether, uh, whatever we think. Um, and uh, two assumptions have shaped my thinking uh, about knowledge and as David mentioned how it has changed during my, my career. The first was my initial rec recognition about 40 years ago, a young sociologist with lots of sort of hopefully radical ideas, uh, when I kind of realized that knowledge wasn't something that special and it wasn't given, but it was actually a social reality that could be changed and was actually created by people. And that seemed to me very important. And this is true whether it's mathematics or literature or democracy or fascism. Always, in some ways, knowledge has its social origins that it was actually produced by human beings in particular contexts embedded in it. That was the first thing. The second assumption was that, which I became aware much later, late, not as late as the late 90s perhaps, 
that certain forms of knowledge, which I want to refer to this afternoon as powerful knowledge, have distinctive properties which we need to hold on to, which I think are absolutely crucial for those of us who work in education. And those properties are emergent from and not solely dependent upon how that knowledge was constructed. So, powerful knowledge then refers to knowledge that is different from our experience, our pupils, our students' experience, from what we pick up in our everyday life. It's knowledge, first of all, that provides us with reliable explanations and predictions about the world, particularly in the case of the scientists, sciences. But it's also knowledge in the humanities and the arts, which may be not a source of generalizations about the world, but they enable us, in the words of my ex-head of department, Basil Bernstein, to think the unthinkable and the not yet thought. We can see, in other words, then, that knowledge in that sense is about how we develop our imagination or the imagination of our students. Now, it follows from this, then, that if, it follows from the idea of powerful knowledge, that in fact it assumes that there is in some kind of way in any field or in relation to any phenomena better knowledge. Now, when I kind of grasp that, and it seems a pretty obvious thing to say it to you now, but it didn't at the time, it turned my whole thinking about what I thought about the curriculum upside down. Because um, if there is better knowledge in any field, then access to it must be an entitlement for all students. There are no grounds, particularly no grounds in terms of social justice, for saying that we should have different knowledge for different students. But, uh, but there are, if there is better knowledge. Um, and it also, it, so it must be the, that must be the starting point for the curriculum, and indeed, more broadly, for what schools are for, whatever else they may do. In reality, of course, it's not always the case. That little point I'll come back to. Now, I find it useful to contrast the idea of the curriculum based on powerful knowledge with a more familiar view, from, certainly from sociology, uh, that sees the curriculum as knowledge of the powerful, focuses on the who rather than the what. Now, this notion, knowledge of the powerful, is itself a powerful idea. It reminds us what I learned long ago, and some of you have probably taken for granted by now, that knowledge of any kind is never given. It always expresses some interests, the interests of those who have the power to define it and not others. Some things in a curriculum or any other research are included and some are excluded. I remember a long time ago coming across the example, which would probably be all too familiar to all of you, that geology was excluded from the 19th century curriculum because it was a thought to undermine people's belief in, people's belief in the creation. That was a classic example. Now, of course, we exclude creation for other reasons, but that's a slightly separate issue. The, problem I, the point I want to make, though, is that this focus on who benefits from a particular curriculum, uh, then, the powerful knowledge argument, important though it is, neglects a deeper educational question which we, whether our sociologists or geographers or historians, need to think about. And that is, what is it that makes some knowledge powerful? I think we have to ask that question. And I think for many of us, we did not ask that question uh, earlier. So, but first I want to say a little bit more about the idea of knowledge uh, as the curriculum as knowledge of the powerful. Because I think we need to kind of be aware of this, but not allow it to take us over. Um, I, s I start with the assumption that those who have power in a society are not stupid. That seems an obvious thing to do, say, but it may be worth saying. In other words, they will always make sure that their children have access to the best knowledge that there is. Uh, and that is why it's important not to dismiss the curriculum of the schools for the powerful, of the Eatons and the Winchesters and the Harrows, as elitist. What is important, I think, from my own personal point of view, is to recognise that the system in which they select children by the wealth of their parents is elitist, and the system that enables them to have the resources to appoint the highest qualified teachers is elitist. But that's a very, very different thing from saying that their curriculum is elitist, and therefore it's an entirely inappropriate curriculum for the majority. It's only any good for the elite. It's also true, of course, that the rich and the powerful find ways of denying powerful knowledge to many pupils in state schools. Often they develop sophisticated ways of, in fact, justifying this. For instance, usually in terms of how they describe 
a section of the pupil population. They're either seen as less able or less motivated or lazy or coming from unsupported families. There's a whole vocabulary that, dicks, that says it's all right, they need different kind of knowledge. Now, unfortunately, we, involve, we as educators, often with the best intentions, sometimes have colluded with a denial uh, of what I call, for, for at least for students after the age of 14, what I call epistemic access. What I mean by that is access to the rules, concepts, and methods of searching for the best knowledge we have. Um, what seems, what too easily happens is that instead of maintaining a curriculum based on entitlement, powerful knowledge for all students, schools accept and sometimes even believe that they're doing the best they can, uh, um, that pupils who find access to powerful knowledge difficult need a curriculum that relates to their experiences and their interests and not to knowledge. This collusion has a long history. From projects in the 1970s, as of you read the history of geography, would have remember something called geography for the young school lever. In other words, the assumption was the non-early lever will have a quite different kind of geography. And similarly, it's not just a geography problem, uh, mathematics for the majority. What about mathematics for the minority? Is that a special kind of maths or what? Uh, and that was the 70s. We have it again now. Some of you may be involved in come across it, the RSA's Opening Minds project, which is skill-based and which uh, replaces subject knowledge with an emphasis on particular list of, of skills. I found out the other day that some research in Bristol, at Bristol University, showed that none of the schools in the more middle-class areas of Bristol had took up the skills-based curriculum. The only the schools it was taken up with was, in fact, in the working and lower middle class areas. And that says something, I think, that we need to hold on to about the inequality, the relationship between knowledge and inequality. So, what is this powerful knowledge and what makes it powerful? Now, I, uh, I want to identify two characteristics of it, which I think are important to me, and say a bit about each of them. The first is that it is differentiated from everyday life from the experience that pupils bring to school. It is this difference, this, differ this separation from everyday life that gives that knowledge its power and make it a key criteria, in my view, for a curriculum. Because in a sense, you don't, uh, kids don't come to school to have more everyday life. That's simple as that. So let me elaborate on this point a bit. Um, unlike experience, powerful knowledge is not tied to particular contexts. Access to it takes learners beyond specific contexts of their experience. And uh, achieving that access is what schools are about and the task of pedagogy, the professional expertise of teachers. And one of the things that one is struck by, I think, in this country particularly, is that in fact, there is a considerable expertise. It is actually, pedagogy is in fact not at all an easy task. It's no easier than being a surgeon. But we don't, in our society, give a recognition of status to the knowledge that those teachers have in that pedagogic work that we give to other professions. And I think as long as we don't, we'll always have a problem of inequality in our system. Now, it's perfectly true that for some pupils, it will be far more of a struggle than others to have, to have access to that knowledge. Uh, but that, I think, is not a reason for giving it up. It would be like, to put it rather crude example, doctors not searching for better treatment when you're ill and the first treatment doesn't work. Uh, extending access to powerful knowledge uh, is, in, in a sense, inevitably alien and at odds to many people's everyday experience. This goes... This goes back historically, way back to Galileo's struggle with the Pope, that it was completely alien to the Pope's experience that, in fact, Galileo's theory about the uh, Earth going around the sun, they couldn't, they couldn't take it. They had a deeply believing experience that said to them something completely else. So the point, the point I want to make here is that, in fact, actually extending that access to, is bound to be a slow process. Now, I think we remember, you, you get a lot of talk these days in the press 
uh, about Finland, because they always come top of the lead tables. They're like the kind of Manchester United of, in fact, the Pisa tables. Time and time again, they, they come. Um, but we also need to remember that 50 or 60 years ago, they were the bottom. They have actually, it's taken 50 or 60 years to achieve what is undoubtedly one of the best education systems. The other thing, which I won't go on about now, but I'll just mention, is that people who go to Finland, they look for some trick, but they don't find it. They don't find schools with incredibly exciting or innovative pedagogy. They don't. They find actually quite traditional pedagogy. What they, what they don't always find, because it's not so easy to see, is that they come, they're going to a society that has enormous respect for knowledge, for teachers, and for education. And in a sense, that seeps right the way through. And one example of it I always give people, because I think it's one that's pretty is dramatic, is that the biggest, the most famous university, University of Helsinki, the Faculty of Education, which is in fact the faculty that people who are going to be teachers uh, join, the Faculty of Education has the uh, highest proportion of applicants to place of any of their faculties, higher than medicine, higher than engineering, higher than classics, higher than business studies, higher than any of the others. Now that says something about the society, and that explains a lot about why, in fact, they have a successful education system. Right. So acquiring powerful knowledge, then, involves acquiring knowledge, and this is important, that, in fact, for pupils, that previously only the teacher had. However, it's important to stress that this is not, as it's sometimes taken to be, a process of transmission. And that I learned, that it's not a one-way process. And I certainly, I was an anti-transmission uh, model of, of teaching for many years until I read Vygotsky. When I, after I'd read Vygotsky, I realized that in fact, the process, his concept of the zone of proximal development was about, in fact, was about a two-way process of relate, moving from the everyday experience of the kids engaging with the theoretical ideas of the discipline or the subject, and then taking that back to making sense of the world that they come from. It's a two-way process, and that, I think, is a really important notion, because, in fact, the thing gets polarised in a lot of debates. I think the key distinction that I want to stress to you that arises out of the notion of knowledge that I've been arguing is one broadly between ends and means, in this case, between curriculum and pedagogy. Now, it's not... Curriculum pedagogy is not a distinction. If you're a teacher, start uh, with your class. You don't come in and say, is this pedagogy, is this curriculum? You don't. In that sense, they are fused in the professional judgments that teachers have to make in their planning, in what they ask teachers to do, kids to do, in how they assess, and all the things that they, uh, they are engaged in doing. So in that sense, it's a fused. They are fused concepts. However, it's a crucial distinction if you're a head teacher of an academy with responsibility for your curriculum, and in fact, it's an equally crucial distinction if you are a, a government designing a national curriculum. Because the curriculum can only specify the concepts that are important that you want the students to have access to. They cannot, it cannot say and should not say anything about what the teachers actually do in their practice. This was the problem with the 2008 uh, curriculum, in my view. And one, I'm not a great fan of the, everything about the new curriculum proposals, but one of the positive things about it, in comparison to the 2008 national curriculum, is that it's about half the size. That in fact, because they've taken out an awful lot of, in a, if you like, the things that the, the earlier one said teachers should try and do. That is, in a sense, if that is the responsibility of teachers as professionals. Um, so, a curriculum, for instance, cannot take... I can see some shaking their heads, but that, we'll debate that later. Uh, <laughs> it's always nice to hear that. Um, at least one's been understood by somebody, which is encouraging. Uh, the, um, the curriculum cannot specify what teachers do or take count of the diversity and mass of pupil interests. That is the responsibility of the teachers with their specialist knowledge and their knowledge of those pupils. So it's a, it's a, there's an interdependent relation, if you like, between a curriculum and pedagogy. Third point, then, 
Curriculum knowledge is not just more experience. It's the concepts enable pupils to think and act beyond experience. That is why the curriculum uh, based on powerful knowledge must drive learning, inquiries, projects, and any school-based activity. And, of course, why it can only do that if, in fact, you've got subjects, especially subject teachers, who are on the staff of the school. Knowledge, and this is a really important aspect of it, I think. Knowledge is always fallible. It's not some absolute truth. It's always the best knowledge we have at now. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, it never can be a top-down imposition if, in fact, that aspect of knowledge is recognised by the teachers. It must always encourage questions, but obviously it's going to encourage different kind of questions than the questions that are raised out of experience. It's not that those are not important, but in a sense, the very nature of knowledge is to lead you to the questions, if you like, that in fact, knowledge as we know it now, whatever field it's in, we don't have answers to. Um, the problem, I think, uh, one of the problems with teaching that is, in a sense, a kind of reaction to what I've referred to as the transmission model, is it all too easily can disconnect the learning activities that pupils are encouraged to engage in from the underlying purposes of those activities, which must be acquiring knowledge that they didn't have when they came to school. So critiques of teaching as transmission are important, and I spent quite a lot of my years writing about why they were important, but they can easily become the opposite when learning at school becomes at best very diff little different from learning in everyday life. The other thing about powerful knowledge that I want to speak a bit about is that in fact powerful knowledge is always specialised knowledge because all human progress actually depends upon specialisation, whether it's in the division of labour or whether it's in the production of new knowledge. And the primary form that specialisation has taken in relation to, to the production and acquisition of knowledge is, in fact, the expansion and development of disciplines. There's a debate, which I haven't got time to go into, about whether or not disciplines remain the core basis for the production of new knowledge, or whether, in fact, circumstances are so changed that, in fact, we need a different approach to how knowledge is produced. But I won't touch on that now. Um, so what, it's important, though, to hold on to what disciplines are. There are sets of concepts and propositions, depending on the field that we're concerned with about the world, but they're also, to use the philosopher Charles Percy's terms, they're also always communities of inquirers. They're forms of social organisation. They have boundaries. They set, and the boundaries set their concepts and their practices apart from the inquiries and activities of others. In other words, and this I think is really important from the point of view of, uh, of the school as well, is that acquiring disciplinary knowledge is about becoming a neophyte member of a new, of a knowledge community. And uh, that is as true for young pupils as it is for people doing PhDs. Most curriculum subjects are the product of recontextualizing disciplines to take account of the intellectual development of learners. And the, History of geography is interesting because it's uh, I'm aware of it. history of geography is interesting because it doesn't exactly fit that model. Um, the last thing here I want to say about uh, about powerful knowledge uh, subjects I think is important is and why they are important as examples of powerful knowledge is that they provide sources of identity. The boundaries themselves are important because you have to work at deciding when what grounds you have for going beyond them for both pupils and for teachers. And the other thing, the reason why, subject, why subjects are important is that, in fact, they're the basis of the authority that teachers have as a profession when parents come and say, why am I doing this? If the, two, if the pupil, if this teacher is say, well, we're doing water this year or energy next year, then in a sense, the topic or theme plays it. Now, it's not that those issues are not important, but really, then, then there are no particular grounds because it might be anything else. But in a sense, what he's saying to the parents is that, in fact, if you want... If you want your child to develop intellectually, then, in a sense, this is the way you have to go back. Now, I'd like to conclude. I don't know whether I've got time to do this, actually, but I'll try and be very brief uh, in the last bit with some thoughts that I've been having about pedagogy and subject analysis because, uh, and, and, uh, and sub because I think that that's where the collaboration between people like me, sociologists, the curriculum, and... Two minutes, right, right. Um, it starts from the recognition that subjects vary 
And one of the ways that, in fact, this is useful to look at is in terms of, uh, of Bernstein's work, in terms of his different notion of knowledge structures. But I won't elaborate on that for the moment. But I have become also interested in the work of the philosopher at King's, Chris Winch, and his concept of the different ways in which epistemic ascent as a way of thinking about progress and learning takes place in different subjects. For example, you might take the example of students progressing from a GCSE in geography to an A-level or from starting an A-level with no GCSE. Maybe the sequencing becomes rather different. Now, the important point that Winch makes, which I want to stress, is that, in fact, all knowledge inquires both, involves both knowing that, acquiring concepts and propositions, and knowing how, acquiring the ability to do things. And that, uh, um, and that is, in a sense, uh, the distinctive thing about learning at school from learning in, in, in everyday life um, is that um, the, the balance towards the knowing that and the knowing how shifts because in a sense the learning is more conceptual and less procedural. Because in a sense it's easier to learn procedures by watching how somebody does something and copying it. Uh, but it's always a balance between the two. And this will vary. I mean, subjects vary between maths and uh, subjects where, in a sense, the concepts like history are much more loosely specified. Um, and uh, now, one of the other points, and just then I'll really conclude, I promise, uh, that in fact Bernstein wrote, which is important, is that in fact, when he was looking at the curriculum, he was saying that the thing, the process we need to look at, and he never really looked at them, is the how knowledge is sequenced, paced, and selected through the curriculum. Now, it seems to me that we know very, that's an interesting beginning. We know very little about those processes, and they may be very important, because if we want to hold on to a powerful knowledge gesture of the curriculum, the immediate, it'll pose, pose acute problems for teachers, because they will come across people who find it very, very difficult, and in a sense, what you do. And some of the things that I've <coughs> criticised are the solutions they've done. But if we know more about those pacing and sequencing things, we may be able to find different different models of sequencing and pacing that are appropriate to different learners. And therefore, we may actually be able to support the broader entitlement to knowledge. Anyway, it's rather quick. I'll finish. Thank you.